Hello, this is Mrs. Garcia, and I will be explaining your six assignments from the Geometry Remote Learning Packet. If at any time you need to pause the video or come back to it, please feel free to do so. Notice at the top of the packet, you have your name, your student ID number, and your advisor's name. All three of these areas need to be filled out. If you are not sure who your advisor is, then you can call the front office at this number and ask them. All right. Be sure to read all that information. The first page here is your for geometry formulas reference sheet. A couple of things to note is you will be using the SA surface area on this packet. You will not need to use the lateral area, LA, for any reason on this packet. Another thing is anytime you see this capital B, this is looking for the area of the base. So you're going to use these area formulas at the top in order to find the area of that base and plug it into the formula. Also, your height is not always going to be the height of, say, a triangle on the base. It'll be the height that connects your two bases, right? On a pyramid, your height will go from the center of the base to the point of your pyramid. So looking at your first lesson on surface area, for each figure or each type of figure, you're given a formula and an explanation for how to solve it. This may or may not be the same as the formulas at the top. This one right here is teaching you to find the area of each side and then add them together. There is also a formula here that simplifies that. So you choose which way would be easier for you. Use the formula in the reference sheet or the formula in explanation here. Another thing to note is anytime you see this pi symbol, we are going to replace it with 3.14. So we're going to use the approximation of pi in order to find our um, our answers, and so your answers will already be um, rounded to the hundredth place for you. So for all of these, follow the formulas. On this last one, notice that these are all spheres, and then you have a hemisphere, so make sure you use the formula for a hemisphere here. That is on your reference sheet. Your second lesson is on the volume of 3D figures. So similar to your last lesson, except now you're using the volume formulas. So make sure you're using the correct formulas on all of these. And again, you're going to use 3.14 as approximation for pi. At the bottom, you do have a mixed practice. So you won't have your formulas right next to you. You will need to look back at your reference sheet. Your oblique cylinder is the same as a regular cylinder. And your oblique cone would be the same as a regular cone. On your third lesson, we are going to start using the scale factor to tell how much larger or smaller a figure is after all the dimensions are multiplied. So the first page focuses only with perimeter and area. And the second page, focuses on area and volume. So whenever you have a scale factor, the scale factor is multiplied to all of your dimensions. And so because perimeter is one dimensional, you are only going to multiply by your scale factor. Area is two dimensional, so you're going to be multiplying by your scale factor squared. And volume is three dimensional, and so you're multiplying by your scale factor cubed. So for example, say our scale factor is equal to two. 
So your perimeter would only be multiplied by 2. But your area will be multiplied by 2 squared, or 4. And your volume is going to be multiplied by 2 cubed, or 8. So your volume doesn't equal 8. Your volume is multiplied by 8. All right? So you're going to use that concept on those two pages. And then you're going to move on to probability. So the last three lessons are on probability. The first one focuses on sample space. But there are a lot of good notes right here that you'll want to go back to uh, throughout the, um, the packet. And so make sure, especially this part right here on theoretical probability. And so on your assignment for sample spaces, here we are focusing on how many options you have and what are those options. And so these first couple questions are asking you to tell every single possible uh, option that you will have given each event. So here your event is you have a hot dog stand. And so your options are small and large. And that's it. But if you're looking at another example, so let's look at a more difficult one down here. A softball player bats twice in a game. At each at bat results in an out getting on base or hitting a home run. And so those are your three options. But she's hitting twice, so she has two events. The first time she bats, she has three options. She's either going to get an out. She's going to go on base, or she's going to get a home run. The second time she bats, same thing. She's either going to get out, go on base, or hit a home run. And so when we we're trying to find the number of those, we would multiply. We have three options here and three options here. So we're going to multiply those. 3 times 3 gives us 9. You should have one with 9 options in here. First she gets it out, and then second time she gets out. First time she bats, she gets out. Second time she goes on base. First time she's out, second time she gets a home run. Same thing here, and the same option here. So you see that there are 9 total options. And this answer choice lists them all out. The second half of that assignment is only focusing on those numbers. And so if you have one event, it's however many options you have in that event. However, if you have more than one event, like in number 15, you're going to multiply those numbers. So here there are two girls and a boy on a trivia team. So you can circle that. We have three total. Two questions remain. That's two events. One team member is randomly picked to answer the first question, and a different member is picked to answer the second question. So the first time, you have three total people in the first event, the first time you answer a question. The second time, because you have to choose a different person, you can't choose the same person you chose the first time, so you only have two people to choose from. So you multiply those numbers together, three times two is six, you have six different options. So you will use that same concept to answer the rest of those. And then moving on to permutation and combination. These are more ways to find the total number of objects in a set. So uh, there is a nice long formula you can use, but we gave you a calculator. Please go to a computer or a phone or a tablet 
and type in this calculator. The only things you need to know is the N, the total number in the set. It's always going to be the larger number. And the R, the, how many are in the subset? This will be the smaller number or it will be the same. So first we have these in our symbol notation. So we have 7P7. This is written in NPR. So your N is 7 and your R is also 7. Down in the word problems, you will have to figure out which number is in, which one is R. So in number five, a group of 25 people are going to run a race. The top three runners earn gold, silver, and bronze. Your N would be 25, and your R would be three. And you would type that into your calculator. The second half is combination. And so same thing as permutation, you have N, then C, then R. So N and R. And you'll do the same thing in the bottom where you pull out which one's your total and which one is your um, subset. Make sure when you're doing combination and permutation that you're pulling the correct number from the calculator it'll give you both the permutation and the combination so just select the answer that goes with that one that it's asking for the last lesson is over independent and dependent events so this is where you might want to go back to lesson four and look at how to write out your theoretical probability you do want to make sure that the number of outcomes for your event is in the numerator, and the number of total is in the denominator. So where am I lines in them? Well, we're just gonna leave it. So event over total, right? Uh, so thinking back to our permutation example, not permutation, the example before that, so I'm going to go ahead and scroll back to here. So if you're looking at independent, the first one will not affect the second one, right? And so here, when, because there are two different people who are answering the question, the first one did affect the second one. So your number of outcomes in the first one was three. The second one was two. You had to subtract one. Whereas up here, the first one would not affect the second one. So if, if a softball player got out on the first one, she would not, it wouldn't affect if she got out, got on base, or hit a home run the second time. And so this would be an independent event, whereas this one would be a dependent event. So going down, back to that lesson. So the first one she's telling are independent or dependent. In the rest of them, you are finding each probability. So remember, you are finding the probability. Things to remember is to keep your fractions in simplest form. And so if you have an even number on a number cube that has six sides, out of six, three of those would be even, two, four, and six. So you'll make sure that you simplify this. Both of those numbers can be divided by three. So divide by three, divide by three. We have one over two, All right? So make sure you're simplifying your fractions. And also, if you have multiple events, so if she's rolling an even number both times, 
you're going to multiply those together. So the first time, it's a one in two chance in rolling it even. And the second time, you have a one in two chance of rolling it even. And so when you multiply those, multiply across the top, one times one is one. Multiply across the bottom, two times two is four. So you have a one in four chance of rolling an even number both times. And this goes for all of them. So no matter how many t events you have, you will multiply those fractions for each one. If you have two, three, or four, you multiply every single time. And this is your packet. Good luck. If you have any questions, be sure to ask your advisor.